Hey, it's Drew. I'm guessing that as a podcast listener, you also enjoy audiobooks. Well, in that case, did you know that the audio version of Renegade Marketing 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands was ranked the number one B2B audiobook by Book Authority? It's kind of cool, right? You can find my book on Audible or your favorite audiobook platform. Now, speaking of podcasts, before we get into today's show, I want to do a shout out to the podcast professionals that share your genius. We started working with them several months ago to make this show even better and have been blown away by both their strategic and executional prowess. If you're thinking about starting a podcast or want to turbocharge your current show, show be sure to talk to Rachel Downey at shareyourgenius.com and tell her Drew sent you. Okay, let's get on to today's episode. Hello, renegade marketers. It's worth repeating that the CMO role is the most bespoke in the C-suite. The range of responsibilities and challenges vary almost infinitely compared with, say, the CFO or, say, the CIO, which is pretty consistent from company to company. And this is just one of the reasons that turnover is so high and year one is such a pressure cooker. In today's episode, what's amazing is we're going to go for a full rebrand, a renaming of a company in just over a year. And we're going to break it down step by step. I think you're going to really enjoy this episode. So have a listen. And with that, I'm going to welcome our guest, Ellie Amati, the CMO of Schlesinger Group. Hello, Ellie. How are you? And where are you? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. I'm in New York City. And as of March 1, we're no longer Schlesinger Group. We are now Seiko. Wait a second. Wait. And how do you spell Seiko? Not like the watch. No, S-A-G-O with a bar line above the A to help pronunciation being Seiko. Okay. Well, now... That was, you started at the company uh, November, 2021, right? So we're now, gosh, uh, 14, 15 months into this thing, but let's go back to the very beginning. You're at the end of the story with a new brand and we're going to get there, but let's go back to, in fact, let's go back before that because people don't necessarily know you. Before you got to your current challenge, I noticed that you don't hide the fact that you started your career or spent some time early in your career at Enron, the company that notoriously lost shareholders $74 billion in four years leading to its bankruptcy in, in 2001. That must have been an insane experience perhaps with some painful lessons learned. Is there anything you'd like to share from that experience? It was my second job being at Enron, and it was very eye-opening. I learned a lot from the brief period of time I was there, but I also got exposed to a lot, obviously, that kind of guided me through my career. But it also gave me some indications of what to look for in red flags sometimes when I join organizations and what are some of those things to look out for. Yeah, and I can imagine it was just such an interesting thing from my outside perspective and what I read about it, because it's one of those that you study, that what you measure matters. <laughs> and in this case, there was only one measure, which was top line growth. And there was sort of lack of orientation looking at how are we getting those numbers? And I, I do think that a single metric focus can lead an organization in a way that you may not want it to. So anyway, that was my big lesson from Enron. Uh, obviously, ethics matter at some point too. So let's now dive into the story at hand. You joins what was Schlesinger Group in November 2021. And I'm curious, From did you have a mandate? We're hiring you to do something when you got there. Yeah, it was to rebrand and build. A lot of organizations where I have joined, a lot of times at that building stage, you know, within company like Sessinger Group, a 57-year-old company, it was time to rebrand because it's not the company it was that long ago. It's not the company it was 10 years ago. So the decision was already made. And I was brought on not just to manage and build a team, MarTech stack and so on, but it was also my biggest mandate was we're doing this rebranding. And I, I could have paused and said, maybe it's not a good idea, but I agreed that it was time. 
I think it's so interesting because one of the things you and I talked about in the in the in the pregame, if you will, is that even though that's the big goal in those first 90 days, you still focused on building it like a demand gen engine, right? And and I want to talk about that and maybe the quick wins and talk about your sort of 30, 60, 90 days and and what kinds of challenges you tackled at that moment. Yeah, having to come in and I had to look at the organization, the team structure, you know, the team skills, what, where we were trying to go and the MarTech stack, what data was providing, what they were providing to us, what were we measuring, what were we reporting on, how we're supporting sales. So I had to look at everything because the demand gen requires all of those pieces, process technology and talent. So I had to I had to keep that in mind with, hey, there's a rebranding. You need huge design work. You need a lot of focus. You need strong brand partners. You need agencies that you have to manage because we don't have things in-house. But I had to build the foundation. And a lot of that required just cleaning house, cleaning out what didn't work, cleaning out the stack, the MarTech stack that didn't provide us with the direction where we wanted to go to start to build that data that we could talk about. So- I'm I'm sort of imagining parallel paths here. There's the sort of underlying plat, the foundation of of demand generation, and then there's the brand and the rebrand. And in many ways, both of those require sort of different assessments on your part. And it's a lot to do in the first 90 days. So uh, when we go back to the people and the technology, because again, you're looking at two different things, right? You're you're looking at the people to say implement demand gen, and then there's the people to implement rebrand. Yes. Different people. Different and so people. did you find yourself sort of looking at what you had and redrawing your organization? And how long did you give yourself to assess the talent, first of all? I didn't have long, but I, because I had managed larger teams than this and other roles, you know, I came from a role that I managed 40 people and I had to do some of the same exercise. I was able to assess skill set and knowledge very quickly and put people in those roles. And a lot of the talent that was missing, for example, for rebranding, I had to go out and outsource. We had to find agency partners because this was not a small task. You're taking a huge company with the owners, the CEO's name on, on the brand, and you're you're changing it. And with that, it was just uh, a lot of work. There's the agency that does a rebranding of the name, and then there's an activation piece. So outsource a lot of that, focus what we could do internally, which was a lot of the demand gen. Okay. As we think about the demand gen, I mean, relative to your past job, where were you from a sophistication standpoint when you started? Not very far. <laughs> so we were using some of the, you know, there's a lot of legacy technology and systems when you walk into organizations like this, because the business just operated differently. A lot of relationship based when you come to such huge organizations that have been around for so long. And now all of a sudden, 21st century, and they're competing with a lot of small, very sophisticated companies that are coming on. And we're like, oh, Wait, what do we got to do? How do we change? How do we pivot? How do we shift? So there was a lot of the outdated technology that we had to clean and there wasn't a lot of data. So, you know, I can give you an example of what my mandates were when I had to walk into my first board presentation and the consequently um, the rest of the, the board presentation, I had one mandate, which was what's going on with the rebranding, right? <laughs> So, you know, they, they all want to talk about the rebranding because that's why you were brought in, but you know, you have more to do than that. So what do you talk to them about? Yeah. And, and I knew at some point the rebranding will, will end, right? And there's still a lot of, I mean, we're just kicking off. So we have still have another year of how to, measuring, how did it go? What are we finding? How successful was it? But I knew that at some point that will end and they're looking for the impact of marketing on the bottom line, which is where a lot of organizations are starting to think about marketing. It's no longer this cost center they're bringing to the front and they're a partner, right? So I piecemeal whatever data I could find. It was literally putting band-aiding things together and taping them together wherever we could go to find some data about metrics about how marketing was performing. I took that to the meetings and I said, before we talk about rebranding, let me show you what we've done in the past few months that I have been here. And that sets the stage for their peaking their interest and, oh, 
what else can you do? Yeah, and I think this is so important. And I've had this conversation on the show and with a lot of CMOs and CMO huddles where those quick wins of and and here's this sort of fundamental problem with your the mandate that you had from the beginning, which is that's what boards often think of marketing at companies who don't know what marketing can do. And so, oh, it's about the logo and the name and the colors and that that stuff. And that's marketing. And that's part of marketing and it's an important part of marketing, but it's not going to turn into revenue tomorrow. Absolutely. And so what's interesting to me is you could have just said, oh, hey, we're, here's where we are with the rebranding, but you didn't. And in fact, you were sort of looking for some quick wins, in fact, right? To sort of show not only are we building up a tech stack and reconsolidating data, but talk a little bit about how you're explaining this to them in a way that they say, well, so what's this have to do with your mandate? <laughs> right, exactly. And if you don't show those things on how you're making those changes that bring impact and you're partnering with sales and, and other teams to show that what marketing can do to support, it very quickly turns into when it comes times for a recession like now, oh, well, we're done with the rebranding, right? Now cut your budget or, you know, you don't need that many people, but you have to show that, you know, what, how you can drive business. So showing, bringing, being able to bring that data and then explaining to them, if we had a better, a cleaner CRM system, for example, if we had a system that integrated with our CRM that was able to to report on the campaigns and the tactics that we are running, look at how much more we could do, right? And here's how much we spend that delivered this result with very outdated systems, but imagine what we could do with a bigger budget. And that starts to help them think about, oh, there's a real value here in, here in what marketing can do. And also the CFO is very pleased when they can see that those numbers, right? So I wanna make sure, I'm guessing that the Schlesinger Group, which has over a thousand employees, which kind of blows me away to begin with, that there's this company out there in in the research space that uh, is that large that I, I was not really familiar with. How did it grow <laughs> without broad-based awareness and without sort of any kind of really sophisticated marketing? Yeah, well, the Schlesinger Group historically was known for a lot of facilities work, focus groups. And a lot of times we work with partners. So as a brand, you may not have worked directly with us, hence why you have not heard of the name. Hopefully with Sago, it changes. But that was kind of the model. And over the past, I want to say six, seven years, and mostly in the last two years, we've made a lot of acquisitions. We invest in a lot of different companies to add to that the solutions and the products that we offer. So we have also inherited a lot of talent from those acquisitions and we've that's how we've grown even more so. Got it. But definitely not a marketing driven organization. Definitely not. I think for most of its history it was a two man team. Two man <laughs> team for a thousand person company that, you know, I mean, there are two men teams on 30 person companies <laughs> and that have very sophisticated marketing engines. Clearly, they had other ways to spend the money that was working to grow the business because the business has grown. If we were going to summarize the this part of the story for a moment and we said you know even though this decision was made before you got there for the listeners you know you need to rebrand when mm -hmm. what's on that list a lot of times people fear the rebranding because of the brand equity which Sessinger group had again 57 years old steve Sessinger, very well known in in the industry and in the market but Again, looking and when you look at the perception, what is the perception of the Schlesinger Group? And that was the huge thing for us when you walk around, even within our, our trade shows that are industry based and you go, oh, Schlesinger Group. And a lot of people think focus groups. Oh, you guys have great facilities and focus groups. That perception is no longer true. We have a, a suite of solutions and products, probably the most comprehensive on the market that people aren't aware of. And when people that doesn't resonate with folks and it's that not on top of mind, that's one of the big reasons that you think it's time for a rebrand. And Steph, Steve Schlesinger stepped back as the CEO and he's the executive board chairman right now. 
So we also have a new CEO. Not that the two were dependent on each other. It was going to happen anyway. But it's also just signaling that the new, fresh, direct, forward-thinking path that we are on, and that starts with this new, fresh name, or I think it's fresh, uh, it's Sago. Okay, we're going to take a break. Stay with us, listeners, because we'll be right back. I want to talk a little bit about both the risks of rebranding and the opportunities. So stay with us. So if you don't mind, I'd like to plug CMO Huddles for a second. Launched in 2020, CMO Huddles is an invitation-only subscription service that brings together elite B2B CMOs to share, care, and dare each other to greatness. CMO Huddles is a force multiplier. Give us an hour a month and we guarantee 10 hours back in time saved, helping you to make faster, better, and more informed decisions. If you're a B2B CMO that can share and care with the best of them, check out cmohuddles.com or hit me up on LinkedIn to see if you qualify. Okay, we're back. So we get started and we talked a little bit about the quick wins and setting up the demand generation engine. Before we go too much more into the process for positioning, was there anything else that you did on the demand gen side that we should talk about? Yes, reshuffling and shifting a lot of the budget. We were, again, we were very conference heavy. And again, it, it's worked for us, but again, shifting a lot of the budget toward more of a demand gen program is huge. Otherwise, you could put all the systems in place that you want and you can hire the talent, but if you don't have the money to spend, what's the outcome? So it all had to work together. So that was another huge piece of the puzzle for us. Yeah, and it makes sense that it would have been all trade shows because it's like a bunch of sales guys or whatever, or the people going there and saying hello to the friends of current customers. And I know that current customers is a big part of that because in the days when I used to do a lot of focus groups, we went to the same moderator who would use the same facility every time. And right. so there's a lot of, of that. And there's nothing wrong with trade shows except for the fact that it was really hard during the <laughs> pandemic to do it. And that is so interesting because, you know, your timing, right? somewhat, you know, in the, still in November 2021, we were still thinking about the pandemic and events were less secure. All right. So you shifted dollars a little bit out of events. So let's, let's get into the repositioning and then the decision to rename. Had the decision to rename been part of this from the beginning, or was that an outcome of the process? It was part of the part of it from the beginning. Again, I was given the option to come in with my expertise and said, don't do it because there's brand equity. But it was very clear to me that it was the right direction to move into. Okay. And so talk a little bit about the process of discovering and finding the new name. And because that is so hard. <laughs> very hard. I believe we went through three rounds of trying to find the right name. And believe it or not, we have called this project internally Project Squid for some time. That became our pseudo name so that because it just wasn't launched yet and we didn't want people asking, oh, what is the Sago thing? We called it Project Squid because that was actually one of the earlier names that we sat with for a minute. We looked at it, we go, oh, it's different. And then we all went home and came back and said, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know, right? And it is very difficult to find it. Slut Ninja Group is very long to, to shorten it and find a four letter word that is not used and no one has bought the domain, you know, this one, the domain we did have to purchase it, but to find one that you can use and there's not a lot of people in your space using it, very difficult. So in the third round, when we landed at this, when you know everyone just sits back and says, oh, that's the one, that's the one. It really, you know, when you know, when you know. So first of all, this name came up and then, of course, everybody immediately goes searching to see if it's been trademarked, and they go and search for the URL, and the URL was for sale, because all four-letter URLs are for sale, and they're, I mean, they're not cheap, yeah. and yeah. you have to sort of rationalize that investment. At any point in time, is there any research done to make sure that this name is, the, is a good name for you? We're a market research firm. <laughs> We, we did. We didn't do an extensive search again because we didn't want to put the name out to a broader market, but we did have some focus groups internally 
because we had to get a representation from each part of the group, members of the different teams and the BUs to make sure that everyone was aligned or if we heard different perspectives. But we also went to a very small external audience to kind of test the name and just get feedback and get reaction from it. And along with that, this is not so much on the name, but we also ran a brand perception survey to understand what people, what clients and what prospects think of us. Do they, the prospects, do they even know the name Schlesinger Group? And when they hear of it, who do they think we are? What do they think we do? And the same thing with the clients. What is the perception when it comes to the Schlesinger Group? So we ran that survey twice to get a benchmark. And now that the rebranding is launched, we're going to run it a couple of times more to see if we have moved the needle on that perception. This is really interesting. So you, you, when you put a new name out there, you have an opportunity to put a new personality on it as well, right? And I'm curious how you figured out what are the good things about Schlesinger that we sort of, from a brand perception standpoint and personality that we want to bring forward? And then what are the new things that we want to add to or hope that, that Sago embodies? When we ran our research, followed by the interviews that the agency conducted during the positioning exercise on our behalf with some of our clients, we learned that the number one reasons our clients choose us is our legacy expertise and hence the trust they put us put in us as a partner. We couldn't ignore what the customers were telling us. However, for those who are more familiar with us and, and the breadth of offerings that we offer across audience and solution and products, this was also mentioned as a differentiator. And we know that if more of our audience was aware of our comprehensive suite of products and solutions, it would be raised more. We're not a company that offers one or two products. So it is, it's difficult for us to say our products does X better than others, because again, we offer so much. And the fact that we offer this comprehensive suite and so many products, it is what sets us apart in the market. Hence our tagline, adaptive solutions, confident decisions. And we lean more into this. Yes, the trust and the expertise is important because that's what the customers are telling us. But we know that it's our adaptive solution and confident decision that is our true differentiator in the market right now. Okay, wait, I've got a lot. I have to write, write adaptive solution, confident decisions. Okay, we've got the URL, we've got the name. You've now shared a tagline, if you will, or positioning statement. Before you went live with this, talk a little bit about sort of the internal marketing activity that you did to prepare employees for this new change. Yeah, so we began with a core group of representation from each one of our teams. And they were, they came along the journey with us from the beginning, providing feedback on every decision and every, every turning point that we had in this process, providing a lot of feedback, guidance, and taking it back to some of the trusted team members and without revealing what was happening and coming back to us with that feedback. As we moved along the journey, we pulled people in as they were needed for, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces when you do a rebranding. This was the first time I had to do a rebranding and I'm a brand new CMO with this huge task of rebranding. I know, you know, we talked about demand gen stuff. I know that space well, but this was, you know, so all the pieces and tasks that have to be, to be managed and make sure that we meet the deadline for launch just a lot. So we pull people in to make sure that they had, they, they were aware. All, you know, we're putting all the pieces in place. And then we didn't do a huge internal launch. By huge, I mean, we didn't do it very that far in advance as where, yes, their recommendation maybe pull people in three to six months ahead. We didn't. There were several reasons for that, but we pulled people in a couple of, I think three, three weeks ahead of the launch. And we ran a lot of internal programs to excite people. Right. We ran a lot of contests, a lot of polling, a lot of opportunity to people. We record a video and tell us why they're excited about this new name and what Sago means to them. We have brand ambassadors that are leading a lot of discussion groups. We show them a lot of the new swag and the new assets and the new videos and that we've created. We created a lot of other internal videos to excite people. So we, although we didn't give it a lot of runway, we did a lot of exciting things that that the positive the feedback has been tremendously positive 
I want to unpack a few of those things because swag is really important. Was there a was there like a desk drop kind of a thing where everybody got their new hats and t-shirts and things? There is. We are providing people with with an option. So everybody gets a, a link and they can choose the swag that they want to get. So we're not sending people something that they weren't interested in. Everybody gets a water bottle. No, it's here's the dollar amount. And you can choose, but also we're, we're, we have an internal system program bonusly where everybody, you can give your peers and your colleagues bonusly points, which can turn into some kind of incentive, like a gift card. And we're tying the swag to this program so that people can even get even more of the branded swag from it. Yeah. And I, I, I love the pick your own swag. I've had a couple of folks uh, on this show in the past. One is Alice. I think it's such a smart thing to do, whether it's employees or, or customers in that so much of swag just gets thrown like trade show swag. Half of it gets thrown away. They just didn't want it. It's bad for the environment. And it's also, it's a nice thing to be able to do, to be able to let someone pick their own and it applies again, customers or prospects. Okay. I don't know bonusly. It's the first time I've heard of that. Talk a little bit about that. It is an internal HR system where you're given a number of points. Every employee is given a number of points to, to dole out on any given month. So I can go in and recognize you, Drew, for this podcast or somebody who helped me with a project and you can give them a certain number of points. They can in turn use those points to purchase a Starbucks card or an Amazon card, very similar to uh, some of these e-gifting platforms that we talk about, but it's very internal focused. I see. So you created all this content and how did you have a sense uh you know, with a thousand employees, I mean, were you trying to make sure that every single employee would not only knew the new name, but knew and could answer a question as to why? Yes, we're creating a lot. We're creating FAQs. We're dropping an email in their inbox from the CEO, from HR, from marketing. We are, again, we have brand ambassadors who have all collectively recorded videos to talk about the story of the why, why are we doing this? We're setting up workshops to bring employees in so they can get more comfortable with the story of why, because that's the biggest fear. If they go out and a customer says, well, why? We've been assessing the group for 57 years. So the story of that, we're not who we were back in the day, that kind of creates some angst for them. So creating, we're, we're creating emails for the BDs that talk to, you know, how they can talk to their customer to tell the story. So we're creating a lot of these assets for them that they can just pick and use, but also workshops to educate them on getting comfortable with the positioning statement to so what do we offer and why we rebrand it. And I'm just curious, what is the short why? We are no longer the company we were under Sussinger Group. We are a combination of all the new acquisitions and the investments and the talent that has been brought in. We offer a comprehensive suite of products and solutions and DIY that did not exist under the Sussinger brand. So it is more of a cohesive, comprehensive offering that we provide, which is different from who people think we were. So several things. One, just I can't emphasize enough the importance of when rebrandings go wrong, they go wrong early because it was insufficiently marketed to employees. And we covered a lot of things you can do. And you notice when Ellie was going through it, it wasn't just email. I mean, you know, the in-person workshops, the brand ambassadors, it's a multi-dimensional campaign. It has to be because if they can't answer the why, it's in trouble. Now, you answered the why about why you needed to change. Is there a why for why, why Sago? I think Sago provides that forward looking, fresh, cool, innovative name that really stands out. If you look at the market research, there's a, we looked at a lot of names that are very on the nose with using the words qual and data. And we really wanted to right. stay away from using any of that because we're not just about one thing and one offering. And we wanted something to that could last. And we feel that some a name like Sago has longevity. And we've done a lot of cool designs around it and that we think that can really stand out if you were to walk into a trade show or a conference, you really, I think Sago stands out. The active voice behind Sago, Sago. 
So you as a customer say, we go. And that's where the active piece came up and why we decided on the say go. And if you see our campaigns moving very shortly, our campaign tag tagline is just say go. There you go. Just say go. Okay, we're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about how this got communicated to customers and what's going to happen in the months and days ahead. Okay, so stay with us. Have you thought about doing some market research, but didn't have the manpower or expertise on your team to make sure your research was methodologically valid, insight rich and newsworthy research that can be a tent pole for an entire quarter's worth of marketing activities, research that your SDRs can use to help move a lead into a genuine opportunity. It's a lot to ask for market research, which is why more and more marketers are coming to Renegade for help in this area. Renegade will help you craft the questionnaire, field the research, analyze the results, and even write up and design the report if your in-house team is too busy. If you're a B2B CMO even thinking about market research, do yourself a favor, visit renegade.com and set up a time for us to chat. Okay, we're back. So we've been talking about this rebrand and it's really exciting because this is just fresh off, off the press, if you will. And I'm first one, before we talk about where you, you're going, talk about how you communicated this to customers, because I am imagining that customers not only drive existing business, but your growth is going to come from them because you've been in business so long. Anybody who's going to do a, the kind of work you do is probably you've reached out to. So talk about the communication plan for customers. So multiple angles here. There is, you know, and we did this when we transitioned the CEO and we have, we added our new CEO, but Steve Sessinger and Reed Cundiff, our new CEO and old CEO, they're going to do an outreach to the clients that they have relationships with. So that happens a day or two before the actual launch. A day before the launch, we also send an email notification to our key clients, again, giving them a heads up ahead of time before it's, it actually goes live. And then on the day of, it was the big email to everyone in the database. There was a press release. There is a, a video, external video drop that is you know using social media on our website. Our website has changed. We have a new, fresh looking website. We have a page on the website dedicated to the rebrand story. So again, that can be used for BDs, for example, that maybe are still a little uncomfortable talking about the why. They can include that link in the email and send to their clients. There's a BD outreach that, hey, I wanted to give you a heads up that my email is going to change within a couple of days. Please add me to your safe list. And also here's a story maybe a, a video. So there's a lot of that happens just to communicate the information out externally. Yeah. And I, again, I just want to emphasize, there's a lot of things that go into this. So many different pieces that you've talked about here. There's one that I've noticed, which is when you change your email address, it's incredibly disruptive because think about all the customers that have Schlesinger Group in their email. And I'm curious if you have a special plan for the email conversion process and how you're thinking about that. Well, part of it is, again, gives the BDs that opportunity to actively have that conversation with clients, even clients that they haven't been in touch with for a long time. It's, hey, my email is changing or watch out for it or add it to your, add it to your safe list. But the actual email change, I have to say, no, beyond that, I hadn't thought about it, but I'd love to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can just tell you that one of the companies that, that I had on, on, on the show, one of the brands was still using in some correspondence, and this was true for like press, like, like when they were right. reaching out to me as press, they would say, in your case, it would be Sago, formerly Schlesinger Group, and it was included in the header yeah. for as a year later. Right. Yes, we do have some plans for that, especially with existing clients and some of the events that we're attending where we're known, again, you know, the industry events that we're presenting is going to be like, you know, we're running a, a, a cocktail hour and the them napkin says formerly Schlesinger Group to make that connection with folks. Now, in some of our segments, when we're going to some of the direct to brand where they've never heard of the Schlesinger Group, 
doesn't make sense. But if you look at some of our, our email signatures right now, we have been a combination of all these acquired companies that they're kind of all over the place. So this gave us an opportunity to clean that and say, we're no longer listing the old company that was acquired a year ago. Everybody's going to have the same email signature. And for a while, it was say formerly Sussinger Group, but not, not a year. Okay. And what about the website? Because there's a lot of equity. What's your plan for managing that? So that, that domain will still redirect to the new website, probably for almost a year. We'll kind of have to see where it drops off. But everything that was a Schlesinger group, it's going to redirect to the new website and it's going to remain. And on there, we're going to call it formerly known as, just again, so people are aware they've reached the right website. Yeah, I, I did a, a whole episode with, it was Jennifer Renault with CMO who had been at two companies that made the decision to just turn off acquired brands and the business tanked. Oh. Yeah. down 30, 40% in a matter of days. So yeah, managing the, the website and the email is, is a lot more important than I think people realize. And it's not sexy at all. And it takes a, a long time. It's typically you see it in acquisitions, but I, I actually have been tracking how Adobe handled both the Marketo and the Magento acquisitions. And interestingly, the Marketo name is almost gone. It's still searchable. The Magento yeah. name is still sort of there and it's interesting, but they had this long transition and I know this is different because this is a name change, but it is, it takes time for people to get into this. And then that sort of speaks to, you had awareness in the industry. Now you have no awareness. Mm -hmm. How did you sort of figure out how much you needed to spend against your community, your targets? And how are you approaching building awareness from zero for the new brand. Yeah, so we're going to continue to be at events and conferences. We didn't scale back because we are a new, it's a new name, new old company, but we still have to be there so that the folks that, and it, for, our, for us, it's a lot of the same folks that go through these conferences. So they can connect the dots very quickly. We put a lot of our advertising budget toward the rebrand. It is going to be a huge focus for us for 2023, because again, we have to build that awareness. We are also going to be present at conferences where we've never been before, because again, we're building this awareness from scratch for some of these, and we need to be in this space. So, and a lot of our demand, Jane, because we can talk about our capabilities and what we offer, but still with a new brand. So everything is really focused around this branding. And that's where most of the budget is going for 2023. Is it safe to assume that the budget is significantly larger than what you had might have spent in previous years? Yes. Yeah. It, it would have to be. Branding budget. It's a whole new big, big budget itself that that can't cannibalize the rest of it. Right. It also, by the way, just as, as we were thinking, you're going to need to... <laughs> From a search standpoint, you maybe are already way ahead of me on this, but you're going to have to now pay for the name Schlesinger to make sure that when anybody ever searches for that. Yes. Yes, right. Is that part of your plan? That is part of the plan. I'll, I'll search, I'll advertising, all the demand gen is going to, it's going to be dual. We have to run it on Schlesinger Group and Sago at the same time and eventually kind of start to shift the budget. So there's, a, there's a, a moment in time. And how do you think you will assess when that time is? Yeah, for, so for search, when we start to see the search on that brand name drop a little bit, I think that's when we can turn down the dial a little bit. I think with the industry that we're in and a lot of the publications where we are present, where we have memberships and associations, that will be a, a faster turnaround for us because I think those people will come on board a lot, a lot faster because there's a relationship there. So, and I think in the newer markets, again, when we're going after expanding into the new segments and regions, they didn't know Sussinger to begin with. I would think audio of some kind is going to be important to this because, you know, if you're a romance per language person, this is Sago. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's going to, you know, that's where we're going to start. And particularly with someone like me who can mispronounce anything. And obviously the tagline, just say go is designed to get people to do that. But how are you making sure they hear it? A, a lot more investment in video this year. We haven't done a lot of video in the past. 
But, you know, for example, we'll be running ads on YouTube, which it's a channel we've never explored before. Again, to kind of give people that opportunity to see a very short snippet of our video, but also hear the name repeated multiple times. So we are running some podcasts. We're asking some partners, some clients and come and do, do interviews with us kind of similar to this. Again, just to get that name and put those audios out there so that people start to hear the name. Yeah, I, I have to say, I think there's a fun opportunity at some point, because I think in three months, when you're still hearing this pronunciation, you can have fun with it. It becomes a meme. Yeah. Uh, and you know, <laughs> and it, it's the kind of thing that people could have fun with on, on TikTok, you know, challenge folks to figure out a way to remind people that it's Sago, not Sago. And we picked just Sago because it gives us that creative opportunity to be a little bit more playful. It's yeah. got a lot of potential to, to play around with this. You know, it's the just say go, but it's also when you think about our comprehensive and everything that we offer is just say go. So it, it's got that dual meaning that we can kind of play around with. Well, it sounds all very exciting. I'm wondering now that you've been through this uh, for more than a year and you're at launch point, what do you wish you knew at the beginning of this that you know now? I wish I knew how much time longer you need to allow for positioning. I think that that is a piece that we really rushed at the end. And even though because all the, the feedback was resonating the same theme, we felt a little bit more comfortable and we're still hearing that. But I would have, if I had known, I would have started that process much further ahead of even thinking about the name. I think the positioning has to come first because that can guide the name search that the journey that you're on. And I'm imagining that part of the delay was building consensus with executive team and getting people to think about positioning who probably never think about that. Yes. And so there's a lot of education. It just takes and handholding and it's awkward because it's not necessarily execution yet. Yeah. And it's education, but it's also, this was a new process for me. So for me, not knowing what is the timeline of the pieces have to fall and where is the gap? Like, do right. we really need to do a positioning exercise? But it's also when you're looking out for vendors, a lot of, there's a lot of agencies that don't do it all. So now you got to go find different agencies to run the different pieces of the project than one maybe ahead of the other. Interesting. And so talk a little bit about the agencies that you worked with and what things they did. Yeah. So for with the agency that we work with to, to pick the name, Again, great agency, but they, you know, when we talked about the activation, like, oh, we don't do activation. So Just now we're running around, running around and searching for another agency to help us with the activation, which they happen to do positioning. So we were able to kind of bundle that one up. And then you're looking for a PR agency. Does the agency do the same PR? Oh, do we have to find another PR agency? So all of these is a lesson learned for me. And I guess for any CMOs, to think about every one of those pieces before you start on this path of rebranding. Yeah. And there's a lot of dependencies here. And this is why I sort of 18 months, I mean, you did it in 11 months and that's a very, very condensed timetable and something gives. Yes. Right. Something has to give in that process, whether it's not quite enough time for the internal sort of uh, process or the, the the customer engagement plan, something gives because it's like on something of this scale, eighteen months is not in is not a unreasonable time oh, frame. Absolutely, I think initially when we started, the idea was nine months. We were like, oh, the six months to nine months, and I thought, oh God, no. But it really is a long process and right. planning is everything. Yeah. And and by the way, it would six to nine months if you're not changing your name. Yeah. If it's a repositioning, maybe a rebranding, but most branding agencies will like roll their eyes and say, wait, what? <laughs> six to nine months for a name change? Yeah. Wow. And, that, and that's if you don't hit a recession. So that's if you that. don't hit a recession. <laughs> All right. So- now, what I'd love for you to do, and in summary, for CMOs who are coming to a new company and their mandate is to rebrand and probably to change the company name, give us two do's and one don't for them to maximize their chance of success. 
Plan, plan, plan. I think it would take time to, to plan, to understand all the moving pieces, to, to understand who the players are, how many vendors that you have to invest in, how many people you need to support you on this. But also, I think the don't is everybody wants to be a part of this. This is a fun project. Everybody wants to have a say so. And there needs to be a line drawn on the number of people you include in the process of providing feedback and having a say so in the name, in the in the color scheme, in you know the pictures that are going to be used. Understand where you need feedback and just put a limit on the number of people who are involved in that process. So agree with 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 all of that. I do think, and I'm just going to sort of put a little bit. You have to have the executive team on board from start to finish. There, there's just you cannot do it without them because they can undermine its success at any point in time. So they have to be done. But you're right. You don't get to great with a committee. And if they're the more on it, the harder it is. So the more people that add, just add another month to the length. Yeah, uh, I mean, I didn't mention the executive because I came in with from the executive mandate of right. this to happen. But you had a lot of folks involved. Yeah. All right. Well, um, Ellie, thank you so much. And, and thank you. It was a really great conversation and quite instructive. Thank you, listeners. If you found this episode of value, please thank Ellie Amati on LinkedIn. And do me a favor and rate us on your favorite podcast app. For more interviews with innovative marketers, visit renegade.com slash podcasts and hit that subscribe button. Renegade Marketers Unite is written and directed by Drew Neiser. Hey, that's me. The show is produced by Melissa Caffrey, Laura Parkin, and our B2B podcast partner, Share Your Genius. The music is by the amazing Burns Twins, and the intro voiceover is Linda Cornelius. To find the transcripts of all episodes, suggest future guests, or learn more about B2B branding, CMO huddles, or my CMO coaching service, check out renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser, and until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.